Hi, it's Dr. Steve from Misericordia University, and welcome to a discussion on intelligence, part of Module 4 for TED 232, Educational Psychology. So think for a moment, how would you define intelligence? Let's look at what several researchers have said intelligence is or what it includes. Stern says that intelligence is reasoning, judgment, it's your memory, and it's the power for a person to think in terms of abstract thoughts. Alfred Binet, who developed the concept of IQ, or intelligence quotient, said, intelligence is a general capacity of a person to consciously adjust your thinking to new requirements. So if you have that adaptation, then that's showing your intelligence. Spearman said that intelligence is the capacity of a, of a person or an organism to adjust itself to increasingly complex environment. So what really is intelligence? So let's begin with the research of Spearman. In the early 1900s, Spearman divided intelligence into two different factors. And he said that there's an S factor, which is task-specific cognition. And he said that there's something that he's going to call a G factor, which is general cognition. Diving into this just a little further, Spearman is suggesting that sometimes a person is better at one task than another, and different people are better at different tasks, and that's how they differ from each other. So while there's that intelligence, that task-specific intelligence, there's also this general intelligence factor, or he termed the, the G factor. He said that really, while there's uh, different abilities from task to task, uh, there's just a general intelligence that exists across all learning situations. If you think about that, that kind of sounds like what we know today as IQ. So this was a precursor to IQ. Um, evidence has suggested that when people are good at learning one thing, they're likely to transfer that and be good at learning other things. Again, that's a general intelligence factor. As we explore general intelligence, it includes the visual spatial processing. It includes your ability to do quantitative or mathematical reasoning. It includes your, your knowledge, your, your whole knowledge base. It also includes two other areas, your working memory capacity and also what's termed your fluid reasoning. In other words, your ability to be able to transfer your thinking capabilities from one area to another area as well. We seek to define intelligence Slavin looks at several of these different elements we already considered and puts them together and describes intelligence as a general aptitude for learning or an ability to acquire and use knowledge and skills. And it can be measured by the ability to deal with abstractions and also to solve problems. So in this statement, you can see the abstraction, uh, you see the ability to solve problems being more the spatial visual and also the mathematical side and also the ability to to tap into your knowledge base as well as be able to transfer that knowledge into different situations the oxford english language dictionary uh, defines intelligence as the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills so just a more simplified more direct version of what Slavin has suggested. So when you look at it, intelligence has def been defined in many different ways, uh, and it includes the capacity for the abstract thinking, logic, your ability to understand, and also including items such as your self-awareness, your ability to learn and to evaluate your own learning and your needs for learning, 
your emotional knowledge, your reasoning capabilities, how you plan, your critical thinking, your ability to be creative and to solve problems. So intelligence really incorporates all of those different concepts. Now, let's consider the concept of IQ, also known as intelligence quotient. 1904, French-born Alfred Binet was responding to the French government's desire to identify children in school who were likely to need special help in school. In other words, they were looking to see, could we measure the intelligence and the aptitudes of students? Like, What are the, the, the possibilities in terms of thinking capacity for different students? Because if we can determine that early, maybe we could plan appropriate interventions in school. So Binet developed what is the first formal measure of intelligence known as IQ. So IQ is really a, a measure of a broad range of skills and different things that a person can perform mentally, and that's expressed in a single score. So when we take a look at the scores that are possible to achieve in IQ, we can look at the IQ classification. This is the original from Binet. You notice that it, it goes from very high, which is 130 or higher, to average. So really about a 100 is an average thinker, an average person of average intelligence and capabilities. Notice that Binet's uh, nomenclature here is between 70 and 79. He considered that borderline and then 69 and below was extremely low. So when we consider borderline, um, he again, remember why he was per performing this and, and setting this up, he wanted to uh, set up to determine who would likely need some kind of extra intervention in schools because they have a lower aptitude mentally. So he was concerned under 70 because that would uh, possibly be considered intellectually disabled. So uh, 70 to 79, he said, well, maybe that's kind of borderline. Now, if we look at some of the more modern value neutral terms, we look at 130 and above as the upper extreme, and then you're well above average, high average. Again, around 100 is going to be an average capacity for thinking, low average, and then simply considered well below and then lower extreme. Now, if you're looking at the low, which is under 70, then an IQ of 140 or above could be considered near genius or genius. Now, for fun, let's consider, and just to understand and process this a little more, what is either the reported IQ score or the estimated or believed IQ score for some notable people. So, in other words, how smart was Einstein? And he's reported to have been about an IQ of 160. So again, def definitely hit the genius level. He's well above 140. Elon Musk, great entrepreneur, seems to have some really great creative ideas. So what kind of IQ is he working with? 155, again, very high intelligence quotient. Another computer great and possible genius is Bill Gates. So what kind of IQ is he working with? It's calculated and estimated based on his, his SAT scores that he is maybe around 157, within a range of plus or minus six. So he could be a little lower than that, could be a little higher than that. We don't know exactly on the IQ scale. What about Jeff Bezos? Again, another uh, really interesting person today with a lot of great ideas, very creative, think outside of the box type of person. What kind of IQ does that person have? Again, through estimates, it's estimated around 145. For fun, what do you think Taylor Swift's IQ is? Now, I think Taylor Swift is not only a good performer, but she seems to be a very good, strong business person. 
So how intelligent is she? It's reported that she has an IQ around 160. So hopefully this helps to process some of these uh, concepts of, of IQ. Again, the average person is around 100, more or less, a little bit around their range, maybe 10 below, 10 above. So interesting thoughts. So does IQ truly measure intelligence? IQ measures the reasoning ability and items such as spatial visual, visualization, memory, and quantitative analysis. Now, while these are important markers of intelligence, they aren't the only ones. And cognitive intelligence alone is not the only predictor of a person's intelligence or success in life. What an IQ test does not measure effectively is creativity, emotional intelligence, and creative thinking. And these are all factors that can significantly influence a person's achievements in life. So considering that, can you change your IQ level? Your IQ will pretty much remain within the same range throughout life. But according to Healthline.com, by engaging in the following types of activities, you may be able to train your brain and thereby maybe help boost your IQ. Engaging in activities such as memory training activities like puzzles, card matching, memory games, and Sudoku. Executive control activities, things that involve decision making. Visual spatial rate reasoning activities, like reading and interpreting a map or solving a maze. Playing a musical instrument, learning a new language, frequent reading, and also by continuing your education. What will not boost your IQ is taking vitamins or studying for an IQ test. Again, your IQ will pretty much remain in the same range throughout life, although you can possibly train your brain and thereby increase your IQ at least by a little. So let's talk for a moment about learning style. By understanding what kind of learner you and your students are, you can gain a better perspective on how to implement learning styles into your teaching. The term learning styles implies that every student learns differently. An individual's learning style refers to the preferential way in which that student absorbs, processes, comprehends, and retains information. I realize that research has not shown that a student's preferred learning style is necessarily the most effective way for that student to learn. The VARC model, and sometimes referred to as the VAC model, suggests three or possibly four different preferred learning styles. As described by Teach.com, the four learning styles are visual learners, Visual learners prefer the use of images, maps, graphic organizers to access and understand new information. You can also have auditory learners. These learners best understand new content through listening and speaking in situations such as lectures and also group discussions. Auditory, auditory learners use repetition as a study technique and they can benefit from the use of mnemonic devices. A third type of preferred learning style is kinesthetic learning. Kinesthetic learners understand information through tactile representations of information. These are hands-on learners. They learn best through figuring things out by hand, by actually manipulating them and trying them. So if we looked at the VAC model, that would consist of those three traditional learning styles. If you consider a fourth style, and that would be now considered part of the VARC model, the fourth style is reading and writing. So students with a strong reading-writing preference learn best through words. These students are note-takers and readers, and they may translate, translate uh, abstract concepts into words. 
Let's take a moment and just compare and contrast three different terms about intelligence and learning. Intelligence is defined as our intellectual potential. Again, it's something we found with IQ uh, that we're born with. It's something that can be measured, and it's a capacity that normally pretty much does not change. Multiple intelligences. Now, this refers to a full range of abilities and talents that a person possesses, and this is based on the work of Howard Gardner. Gardner theorizes that people do not have just an intellectual capacity, like an IQ, but they also have many different kinds of intelligence. At our next class, we're going to consider multiple intelligences. And let's compare one last term, learning style. Remember that learning style refers to how an individual learner approaches learning, the way that they prefer to, to acquire and process new information. So as you can see, learning style is not the same as intelligence. Do you know your preferred learning style? Are you more of a visual learner? Are you an auditory learner? Do you like to be hands-on and you're a kinesthetic learner? Or are you a learner who prefers reading and writing? Or are you some combination of multiple of these styles? To process this information and to give you better insights into your own style of learning, which can definitely impact the way that you teach, let's engage in taking a, a brief learning style quiz. And then let's hold a brief discussion online to debrief about different learning styles. So in this video, to review quickly, we considered intelligence. And we started by defining intelligence. We looked at Spearman's two-factor theory of intelligence. We looked at IQ, which is intelligence quotient. And then we culminated by considering learning styles and the VARC or VAC model. Hope you enjoyed today's class and this video. I look forward to seeing you at our next in-person class.